So welcome to the 2080 panel for New York Comic Con's latest online event. This is the Judge Dredd Policing and Satire in 2020 panel. And uh, I've got a lineup of four great guests. First off, my name is Mike Molsha. I'm the uh, PR guy for 2080 and also uh, a writer about Judge Dredd. And I'm joined by Chloe Maville, uh, who is a writer and critic who has written uh, about Judge Dredd in 2000 AD. Um, I'm also joined by Evan Narcisse, who is uh, a combat writer and critic. Kelly Kanayama is uh, another <laughs> critic, <laughs> comic book critic, uh, who writes uh, about uh, Garth Ennis predominantly at the moment, but also has written about Judge Dredd. And Judge Dredd writer Arthur Wyatt, who is uh, one of the two writers behind the current 2080 uh, Judge Dredd story, Carry the Nine, which touches on some real world issues, which we'll talk about in a moment. So welcome, everybody. Um, Judge Dredd is one of those characters that is being evoked a lot at the moment. As we see events unfold in the US and in the UK, the issue of uh, authority, of law and order, and of policing has uh, never really been uh, as um, uh, divisive, as um, inflammatory, uh, and as central to our understanding of what's happening in the world as it is at the moment. Chloe, I, I want to come to you first, uh, because you recently wrote a piece uh, about Judge Dredd and what's happening, uh, particularly, in, uh, uh, or has been happening in Portland over the last few months. Do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about your feelings on this subject and what you think Dredd can say as a character in this day and age? Oh boy, I got a lot of feelings about it. Um, <laughs> uh, if anybody who's turned on the news has seen uh, for the past like six months, there have been uh, the protests here in Portland, which is where I live. And um, right around that time was when I started rereading uh, the revolution storyline <laughs> for Judge Dredd, where it's essentially um, people pushing back, people of Mega City One trying to push back for democracy. And they start writing in the streets and you see picket signs and all this stuff and chanting and it's entirely peaceful. And the justice department is kind of like working back alleys to try and like make sure that get cut short, but also make the people feel like they can be heard. And I was just like, Oh shit, Like <laughs> this is not a good time. And in that sense, like going back and rereading all of these stories that have happened 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, and it being just so true to what there is now, I think that dread has become this thing where um, kind of it, everybody knows that it's a warning sign. The warning sign of fascism is if you start looking like Judge Dredd, maybe, just maybe, you are a fascist, but uh, it's becoming more and more relevant. And the more stories you read, the more you're like, okay, so this is the basis of what we can really be looking at right now. And uh, it's made, it's, it's definitely made reading more interesting in that sense. <laughs> it, it, it's that uh, visual imagery, visual imagery. It's that, it's that imagery of, um, Dread in his uniform, you know, with the pads, uh, the, 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 um, the idea of militarization of the police that really seems to have struck a chord over the, uh, over the last few months as, as people start to see in, in. That's because the guys that are out there look exactly like that. <laughs> I think too, Mike, um, you know, one of, one of the, the, the scary things about the proximity that Chloe's talking about, right, between this, that fiction and this reality is that like um in in the comics dread essentially has impunity right like you know like there has to be like a a high council you know um review board whenever he crosses the line but that's a that's a rare thing right like uh, dread can pretty much do what he wants when he wants because you know quote unquote i am the law right and and uh i think that's what uh how many police officers want to operate and and uh, indeed you know already do operate that way like you know they they have sole authority 
to, you know, determine whether someone can walk away from an interaction or not, you know? And if they make the call to kill that person, they, they then want, you know, to suffer no consequences, you know? And, and, and the thing that, that about dread that's so wild is that like, you know, in the eighties, um, uh, when this character was like really becoming globally popular, um, this all seemed so far off, you know? And that wasn't so long ago. Uh, and now uh, we, 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 we see, you know, members of the press, uh, members, elected officials being gassed and, 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 and brutalized um, by American police. So like, uh, like what Chloe's saying tr is, is true, is that like, you know, the uh, dread always represented a future you never want to find yourself in. And we are, I think, um, perilously close. There's there's always that element, and it's been interesting to see this over, uh, play out over the last few months of um, justification. Um, so there's uh, an incredible moment in um, Letter from uh, sorry in, in Revolution, uh, where Chief Judge Sil Silver says to Dread, "On this, you write the law," which is. Um, very much an appeal to the notion of the judges are not justice they're the maintenance of order they're they're instant retribution for people stepping over the line and so it, it's it's horrifying to see that notion play out in kind of real time you know it, you, you have elected officials and commentators uh, excusing brutality uh, heavy-handed policing murder with, murder um with the uh the excuse of well they stepped out of line they shouldn't have been doing what they were what they were doing do you think that that is a line that has been crossed in the american consciousness over the last few years um, i would say it just for me i would say it's um that line is is just be more and more people are drawing it or you know going over it with their own <laughs> pencils or what have you i think that's always been um in terms of the preservation of law and order that's always been an issue it's just who is who speaks out against it who is affected by it and now now people are saying yes this is really bad because other members of um, these institutions society, that we see yeah. as preserving law and order are getting targeted or are getting um, <clears throat> attacked or injured or murdered, what have you, by the police. But, you know, where, what, where was this outrage? Not that it didn't exist, but where was this outrage, you know, in the 50s, in the 60s? Where was this outrage in the 1940s when citizens, American citizens were getting pulled out of their houses and shipped off to internment camps, losing their property, lose, you know, losing everything they had because they happened to be a particular race. Yeah. I think what we're seeing now is more and more people are speaking up. And so now there's a lot of pushback from the people who want to justify it. And, you know, it, it keeps escalating because for the police, there seems to be there, um, you know, where is the cap to preserve law and order? If your job is to preserve law and order, then anyone who speaks out against you is against law and order, right? But now that there's so many people speaking out, this is something possibly that nobody really planned for. And, so I think that's part of why we see what we're seeing now. I think there's, there's definitely deep historical roots. I think it's it's not an accident that Dread gets very associated with like the 80s and a lot of these trends in policing kind of started in the 80s. I mean, I think a lot of them started with the 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 sort of pushback against the civil rights movement. Uh, but you also saw the, the increasing militarization take off 
uh, in the 80s, the sort of gang policing, I think, kind of happened in the, the 80s and, and, and early 90s. And it, it all sort of pushed police uh, f from, you know, the sort of officer friendly types towards this sort of very uh, militarized uh, and um, separate from the civilian population version of police. Um, there's also been att attempts at reform, which usually end up uh, in, in basically a bunch of, of funding for special training. And, and the special training actually all ends up making them more Judge Dread like it all goes into, um, you know, things like, uh, you know, situational response training that, that, that t tends to push them towards a, an instant deadly response to any infraction. Um, more equipment, more riot equipment, this whole, um, this whole very build up armored look that's been, been creeping up on us over time. I think a lot of that does actually date back to the eighties. Um, in the UK, I think, you know, it was probably more the riots we had then and the, the minor strikes and onwards, there was a lot of social unrest. So you would, you would see police out in, in this gear but really it's happened globally. I mean, that, that, that's an interesting thing to, to, to ponder that, um, and that, that divide between what a policeman in Britain is and what a policeman in America <clears throat> is and how they are, they are viewed and, and where their um, sense of authority comes from. Because in, in, in Britain, we have what's called the Peelian principles. Now, these are uh, very much hammered into new recruits during their initial training, which is uh, the notion of community policing. That when you're a policeman, you are part of a community and um, there is a kind of social contract. And since uh, from the 1970s onwards, the increase in, as Arthur says, situational responses, so riot cops, you know, cops for dealing with specific issues has strained that. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, in the American perspective on this because, of course, in America, the history of the police is, is not the same it's, as in Britain. It's different. Very, it's very, very different. different. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I think there, were, there was probably some kind of civil, um, sometimes private and for profit, uh, uh, you know, collections of, of people, probably mostly men, um, that were, you know, uh, tasked to handle like legal disputes, right? Like uh, interpersonal disputes. But, um, you know, I think something that's becoming really prevalent in, in political conversation in America nowadays is thinking about uh, how uh, uh, in, in a lot of parts of the country, an organized, a more organized system of averting crime is uh, came from from slave patrols. You know, like in the 19th century, um, you know, it was very common, obviously, for uh, people who owned uh, enslaved people to want their property back. The people that they saw as their property back, and um, um, people were empowered to cross state lines and retrieve retrieve that. You know, and I think that infrastructure, especially in southern states. Um, um, led to the kind of formal organization of police as we know it today. It's, it's one step in the evolution, right? And I think mm -hmm. an important one. And when you think about how uh, uh, modern day policing does reinforce um, uh, class divides, you know, and racial divides, like it, it makes sense. And, and, and what Arthur was saying before is really important because um, police are always deployed in an us versus them situation, right? And what you were saying, uh, Michael, before about um, community policing, that's a concept we don't see a lot of in the United States, actually, you know? Like, uh, when I was growing up in New York City, um, and police reform was, was constantly being discussed, like, in the late 80s and the early 90s, one of the things what, that was brought up was uh, a lot of cops don't live in the areas where they work, you know? Like, a cop who might work in Brooklyn or Harlem could live in Staten Island, you know, or lives of like up in the Bronx, you know, is not part of the community, doesn't know the people there, doesn't know situations there. So that, that makes them a lot easier, a, a, makes it a lot easier for them to kind of um, regress to stereotype when, when, when thinking about the people they interact with, right? And when you bring it back to somebody like Dredd, you know, like to Dredd, 
like uh, uh, compassion is like a, a way, 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 way down in his traits. You know, Arthur, correct me if I'm wrong, but no like, offense. I feel like, <laughs> yeah. And I feel it's like that, but a lot on top. Right. Right. And the thing, you know, if you think about the hierarchy of needs for dread, it's like doing the job of, uh, above all else. And I feel like, again, uh, that that's, what most cops um, um, seem to be operating off of the same hierarchy. And, you know, what's really scary thing about the name of this panel is like, like the distance between satire and reality now is like super, super small. And it almost feels like uh, uh, it, we're past the cautionary tale aspect of it all. Mm -hmm. um, and like, we're, it feels like we're living in a really, <clears throat> frightening fiction yeah i mean i think one one of the differences that well at least on paper between judge dread and both america and britain is that the you know in america and britain there are other branches of government there's parliament there's the there's congress um i was going to say there's the president but no nah. um <laughs> <laughs> you know in, in other circumstances there was the president um and they theoretically could work for or against, with or um, in, or in contrast to the cause. And in Judge Red, I mean, there's a mayor, but they haven't had a really good track record there. the The most popular one they've ever had, the most popular ones they've ever had, were the orangutan and the serial killer. When we talk about reform, you know. In Judge Red, that, that would be just a completely different thing because there's no one else. Yeah. And they, we never, I mean, yeah, they are the law. Right. Because we never there's see, nothing else. The funny thing about Dread is that, you know, one, one of the things that makes you accept the authoritarian kind of framing of that fiction is that, like, the, the world's on the brink, right? Like, this is post nuclear apocalypse, you know? Like, like, humanity really is like uh uh on the wane right you know um but uh it makes it easier to understand that there might be need to be some kind of expedited legislative you know uh uh, uh process right or a non-existent one we really really don't see a legislative process in 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 dread comics um the problem is you know it feels like, again, we're trending towards that in the United States where like, you know, any kind of legislative conversation about how to better reapportion funds or uh, reform the way the job is done, like the, 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 the people don't even want to have that discussion, you know, they just want, the, you know, I think the people who support cops like uh, um, blindly just want them to be able to do out their job out there and, and and lean back on the training that they get um, without even really knowing what it is or what, what measures go into place to like um, uh, help keep it more humane. So yeah, the idea that like is just enforcement uh, uh, that's, that's untethered to like a community or <laughs> any kind of legislation, uh, legislative uh, oversight is frightening. Well, it's 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 funny with the uh, the idea of there being checks and balances in the Judge Dredd universe because kind of part of the whole idea of how the judges got started uh, is in the direction of you know power to the people community policing all this stuff well we tried that with them one time and we saw how that turned out so every time there's kind of a push for these checks and balances and for something to be put in place where there is more power to the people and there is more uh fairness and leniency when it comes to lawmaking uh that just means oh we're gonna go back to how it was before and we didn't like that because it didn't meet our values so we need to push into this harder so it ends up coming kind of full circle and then doubling back even again mm -hmm. for more. <clears throat> so the more freedom you try to get within this universe, the harder the strap's going to come down. People can often get caught up in um, Dread being a parody of America, when of course it's not. It's a parody of Britain that uses America and the American way of thinking of parodying 
Britain? I would say, you know, it's it's kind of a mix of things that Dread is. I mean, the the nature of Dread is is very ephemeral in the it it can be a parody of the UK, can parody US events. It more likely parodies uh, US media portrayal of events or US media. Uh, the whole thing is if you trace it back kind of a riff on Dirty Harry. So um, via Dirty Harry to uh, One Eye Jack to Dread, there's kind of a, a causal chain of, 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 you know, what this thing is. And, and the idea was to do tough policing, which I think was kind of an American thing. Uh, I think some of the things that are included and not included are, uh, are kind of tells about it being uh, British. I mean, it's, it's got a kind of class consciousness that you would not really see in, in, in American work usually. Yeah, Dread has always been about Britain, but it's always been taken America on as this sort of cover for what it's, for part, partially as a cover, but partially as, that is part of its mission almost, to be subversive. And at the time, one of the ways to do that was, you know, sticking two fingers up to the garden's culture and saying, screw you, we're going to set this all in America, and it's going to be violent, and, it, and it's going to have guns, and we're going to say that, um, you know, future police are super violent and that we're heading to the, in the future you're allowed to just shoot people for littering if you're a cop because that's legal it's the law can dread uh, picking up on a, a comment that that uh, uh, evan made earlier about we're, we're kind of past the point of this being a warning can dread still be relevant now do we think uh <laughs> It, it can horribly be relevant when you're writing it. Uh, that's that's the bit you don't like is when you're writing something and it suddenly turns out relevant on your local TV screen. Um, recently, so um, you mentioned Carry the Nine that uh, I'm doing with uh, Rob at the moment. Um, there's there's actually quite a lead time on on comics, so uh, that we came up with. I want to say about 20 weeks ago, just before uh, end of day started running anyway. So I, I kind of ended up with, we, well, me and Rob both kind of ended up with a story that's like super relevant, almost by accident. Uh, and in a way that's, that, that feels better than like um, trying to actually chase whatever is, is happening now. And I think you, you more and more just end up colliding with these things. If you're thinking about policing at all, I think, and you write the thing thinking about policing, which I think is the only ethical way to do it, then you're going to collide with this sort of thing more and more. One of the uh, issues that often comes up with Dread is when he um, is... Uh, received as a kind of Punisher-like figure, as, as a, 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 an idealistic figure um the Ew. sheer number of tweets that we see through the <laughs> accounts where where people say you know we need judge dead all this that and the other so they're kind of missing the one but does that mean that that, that sometimes the symbolism of dread can be too powerful for the satire it's trying to make can in the words of susan sontag uh, beauty uh, you know beauty is fascism or aesthetics is fascism the um, the symbol can become so loaded and bright that it can eclipse the satire it's trying to make. He's got all the symbolism, like up and down from uh, even the little things in his eyes. He's definitely got all the symbolism there. Um, I mean, I think the thing with Dread is what he does, what he, what the enjoyment of the comic is based on, at least in part is him violently hurting people you see as bad. Like, even if you are enjoying it as a, a satire, you know, you are reading a, a thing that's sort of all about the violence and, and, and vengeance and, you know, this lizard brain, brain stuff of, um, you know, 
here's something that's been done that's going wrong and it must be avenged. It's, it's not even law, it's just cracking heads. Uh, and that I think is, is the thing that, that's on the surface that gets picked up by, uh, as you say, a lot of these sort of tweet accounts where people are saying, uh, we need Judge Dredd. Um, a lot of people who just sort of, you know, maybe not even reading it, just know there's a guy called Judge Dredd who punches people and has a poster where he shouts, I am the law. Um, that, that all gets out there even if the rest gets left behind. And yeah, that is worrisome. Um, I am complicit in that, of course, because I'm, I'm sort of pumping out that product. Um, I, I guess what I always sort of think is, uh, am I making it worth it uh, with the stories I'm telling? I like to think most of the time I am. There's, you know, enough of an element if you actually read them to know that it's not just about that, that lizard brain thing. But yeah, you, you're always going to have a problem where the, the surface of a thing is all that exists for people who, who experience it only on a surface level. There's a, a small comic that somebody drew, and I can't remember for the I've been trying to remember who it was, but they did a comic, and it's, you know, Judge Dredd with looking all serious and stuff, and it's somebody saying, cool cop, and it's a bullet going over Dredd's head, but it says, the point. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I mean, that kind of that kind of sums it up. And most of the people, at least that I've run across, are all people that usually haven't really gotten into Judge Dredd at all, but are familiar enough with maybe the movie or uh, especially the Stallone movie for some reason. That's always the go-to. And I'm like, just stop. I think, yeah, there, there, there is still the capacity and the need um, and the desire uh, for satire to come through a vessel like Dredd, right? Like, um, you know, he's ripe for that kind of commentary. Um, and, 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 and I think it's come up several times during this panel was was conceived as such, right? He was conceived as a vessel for for satir satirical thematic delivery. Um, but I think the, what creates this interesting tension is that like the conventions of the world in which he operates inherently limits like um, his capacity to, to to be a vehicle for that kind of messaging, right? Even if somebody like Dread recognizes that the ultimate evil is something he takes part in perpetuating in, he's not gonna be uh, a burn it all down guy, you know? He's like, well, you know, it's, it's the cost we pay, right? Um, he's gonna be that guy. He's gonna be an apologist, even if he realizes that the system, there's, there's an injustice inherent to the system in which he operates. Um, so I, like I said, there's like an interesting tension to that. Um, and you can, you, can, you can use that as a, as a springboard for satire, I think. Um, but I feel like inherently, Dread is hamstrung um, in some in some foundational ways. Of course, there's the the, the wonderful moment with um, uh, uh, Origins and the Tour of Duty, um, where uh, he tries to change the system a little bit, and the system fundamentally breaks, which uh, <laughs> is a hell of a comment on before. But uh, I taken up far too much of your time, so thank you to you all uh, for uh, for what has been an absolutely fascinating discussion, um, and uh, yeah. Cheers, and uh, here's hoping that Judge Dredd isn't in our future.